Good morning, this is Nigel Farage bringing you the latest edition of Phone Farage on LBC. I'll be here for the next 30 minutes taking your calls and this is your chance to put any question you like to me and I'll do my very best to answer it. So the number for you to get involved to put your question is 0345 60 60 973 that's 0345 60 60 973 and don't forget you can also watch Phone Farage on the website at lbc.co.uk and we have our first caller and it is John in Eastbourne good morning yeah good morning Nigel I wish you well today um, I would like to make a statement that both the UK and the US we actually inst- instigated the death of both uh, Saddam Hussein uh, and Gaddafi uh, which has now basically led to the worst human catastrophe since the second world war we like thousands of immigrants are now fleeing uh, to, to, to the EU and Britain. And I, I, I obviously, at the end of the day, we want to remain, if we possibly can, uh, you know, a humanitarian nation. But, you know, there has to be a limit, sure, to how many people mm. we can take in. Well, I mean, John, I mean... Day, you know, so we are going to destroy our own societies, as, as, as far as I can see, you know. John, hang on the line. Let's hear from Mr Farage. I will bring you back, Mr Farage. I really can't disagree much, uh, John, with the first part of what you said there. Um, I found myself uh, looking on with astonishment when David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy started to bomb Libya uh, to get rid of Gaddafi. And whatever you thought of Gaddafi, um, at least he was secular. Funny, isn't it? Before Gaddafi was killed, before that war started, he said, if you get rid of me, you'll have five million migrants. Interesting that Gaddafi's words are now coming back to haunt us. And of course, John, Libya has been the conduit over the course of the last year from which most of the boats have come. What is happening from Turkey uh, with the Syrian people is, in fact, the, you know, the latest phase, but the vast majority have come through Libya. So, yes, we do bear um, a degree of culpability for destabilising the region and for creating an environment, I'm afraid, in which ISIS uh, can flourish. Uh, now, look, your bigger point. It, the problem is this. Uh, and, and there is a big difference between the definition, I think, of what is a genuine refugee and what is an eco- economic migrant. But even leaving that aside, I tried in April this year, nine days before the general election, uh, to make this an election issue, to try and wake people up as to what was going on. And I flew to Strasbourg uh, and I spoke to Mr. Juncker, the Commission President, and I said, uh, you are now today implementing an EU common asylum policy, which is set so much more broadly than the traditional measure for what an asylum seeker or refugee should be, that it basically means anybody that comes from Africa, the Middle East, can come, and as soon as they set one foot on European soil, they can stay. And I then predicted, John, in May, I said uh, that I thought the result of this policy would be that we would see an exodus of biblical proportions. And that is what we're beginning to see. So there's a part of us, of course, that wants to be compassionate. Um, And there's, it's amazing what one photograph can do. You know, 71 people died in that lorry, were found dead in Austria at the weekend. We didn't see that, um, you you know, in terms of picture form, but the picture of the three-year-old boy, you know, has made people naturally feel compassionate. How did it make you feel, Mr. Farage? I, I, it's horrible. It's horrible. But I'm afraid unsurprising. And and here's the real problem. The real problem is the message has been sent. Anybody that comes from from almost anywhere and put, sets foot in European soil can stay. That problem has now been compounded by Angela Merkel this week saying the doors are open. Please come to Germany. You know, we'll take 800,000 um, and then we'll pressure the rest of Europe to take more. Um, and you saw pictures of those people. Um, in Budapest at the train station. Nearly all young males, interestingly, chanting Germany, Germany. What do you mean by interest? Why is that interesting? Uh, Because I I suspect, and this this may be unfashionable, uh, but I suspect that the Prime Minister of Slovakia, uh, Robert Fico, uh, when he said on Tuesday uh, that European leaders are not telling the truth about most of the people that are coming, 95% of those that are coming are economic migrants. So it is, yes, of course, there are women and children involved, but actually the overwhelming number are young men. So, so John, this is the problem. We've sent out a message to the world that anyone can come. That is why they're coming. And if we want to stop images like that 
picture of that three-year-old boy being taken out of the sea, then we have to stop the boats from coming. I think that's that, 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 that is absolutely vital. And don't forget, Australia faced exactly this crisis back in 2008, and they said, if you want to come to Australia, don't come via this route or you won't be accepted. I, John, this country has a much longer tradition of accepting genuine refugees than any other European country. Uh, and I have no difficulty or problem with that far from it. Uh, but we ourselves, if we're going to offer refugee status to some people from Syria, and I said two or three years ago that I thought we should, I was the first party leader actually to say this, uh, to do that. Firstly, we must put our own house in order and get back control of our borders to make it more politically acceptable uh, to take people. Uh, but also, we must not encourage people who want to become refugees in Britain to come over the oceans. John, a response from what you've heard? Yeah, I just think basically Nigel's right. We are obviously encouraging a lot of people to come. And it would be, we at this present time, we can't even house the people we've got in this country now. And I think with Cameron's proposal to accept thousands of people out of these, uh, out of these camps, uh, they're not even anywhere near Calais. We've still got the major problem with thousands of people gathered at Calais. Um, and I think whatever happens, we are definitely heading for a sort of catastrophic situation. Thank you for I'm that, John. So. A, a, point, a quick point from you before we yeah. move on. Uh, the Prime Minister would appear to be bowing to public opinion. We're waiting to hear. Well, him. actually, there's a, there's a huge level of myth in this over Go the ahead. last couple of days. We already accept refugees and asylum seekers every year. There were 25,000 applications for asylum in Britain last year. There were more than that the year before. Uh, actually, without changing the numbers at all, we can allow more Syrians to come to Britain. I, I, you know, I don't see that as a problem. What I see, Nick, as a problem is that last year we took 640,000 people. Only 4% of those were refugees. And I think if Britain got back control of its borders outside the European Union, we move to a skills-based immigration policy, drastically reduce the numbers coming to Britain every year, we would have more room and more space you know, in our own political but, will to help genuine people. But Nigel Farage, I can hear people shouting at the radio, well, perhaps that little boy's dad didn't have a skill, the one who's trying to get into Europe. Well, uh, but... Uh, now, look, this is obviously very difficult, yes. very emotive, but they but were... in got 330,000 people signing I, this petition. I completely understand that, but they were living in Turkey. I thought Turkey was a safe country. I thought Turkey was a NATO member. Um, I, 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 you, you know, I mean, they are victims of ISIS, aren't they? And because that's also worth thinking about is who are the beneficiaries of this trafficking trade? Again, it's ISIS. So, so, uh, you know, not easy. None of this is easy. But I think we're sending out the wrong signals. And I fear that what the German Chancellor has done this week uh, could lead to ever faster people coming and taking even greater risks. It's good news for the criminal traffickers, but not for anybody else particularly. Uh, the next caller is James M. Romford. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Hi. Yes, uh, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that we can't fault any of these people for escaping war, tragedy, death from ISIS. But um, at the same time, I can't help but feel that we've suffered for years and years under the Blair and Brown, Cloward and Piven strategy, which I think was what you were talking about just then. And David Cameron's utter failure to do anything other than gallivant around the world, selling arms to our own watch list. You know, my question for you is, what is your party going to do to maintain our national identity whilst helping the real asylum seekers? Well, that's what, right. What no, no I, I, I like the emphasis of that because that's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is for us to maintain our traditional role of helping genuine refugees around the country and to have the political will uh, to do that on a sustainable basis, we first need to get back control of our borders. And I, th I, I think the two are perfectly linked. Uh, James, I, I have to say, you know, we have an EU referendum coming up. No one knows when it's going to be. I suspect it'll be sooner rather than later. Um, Why? Because I don't see any merit in Cameron prolonging these negotiations until 2017. Uh, he isn't going to get anything. You know, I mean, I, I, I sat, He's in Madrid today, of course, yeah, isn't yeah, he? I sat yesterday with Martin Schulz, the president of the European Parliament, and the heads of all the big European political parties, the Socialist Group, the Conservative Group, the Greens, the Liberals. Uh, and believe me, the mood to concede to Britain does not exist.
it does not exist. And interestingly, uh, the European Parliament... They won't just give him a something, just a well, fig leaf to wave. Well, they? they may give him a fig leaf, but I think the British public are looking for a little bit more than that. Uh, interestingly, uh, the European Parliament yesterday have extended an invitation to Mr Cameron to come and address them in October or November. And I'd be very interested to see uh, whether he accepts that. And perhaps if we then see Mr Cameron in front publicly of the big European political leaders, I think the British public will be shocked um, at the attitudes towards Britain getting concessions. There aren't many there. So, James, I'm saying to you, let's get back control of our borders. Let's change our immigration policy. And when we do that, we'll be in a fitter, better position to help. And I emphasise again, genuine refugees. We move on. Thanks. Uh, we James. certainly do. And we go down to Swindon, where I was on Monday morning. I, 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 I popped into some uh, radio studios and it's Eve in Swindon. And Eve, I was a bit mystified in Swindon. I couldn't find at half past seven in the morning a coffee shop open anywhere. <laughs> but perhaps you could help me with perhaps that. Perhaps you can open one. <laughs> no, I'm sure you'd be welcome at my house anytime. Oh, if I'd known, of course, it would have been different, wouldn't it? Good Sorted morning. Yeah. For next time. Keep a good work up. Thank you. What I want, wanted to yeah. say, Nigel, is all these um, immigrants are coming over here, all the men, um, I think I heard it on Nick's programme this morning, if, they, if their country is being taken over, wouldn't you, if there was thousands and thousands of young men, wouldn't you try and fight to keep your country? Well, I think it's very interesting that uh, one of the comments that was made yesterday by a senior Hungarian Conservative MP, he said, S watching the migrants coming into Hungary, uh, seeing the cell phones they had and some of the clothes they were wearing and knowing how much money they'd paid to the traffickers to get them there, he made the observation that actually they, w they were better off than many people living in rural Hungary. And I thought that was quite an interesting point. There is, when you get depopulation of an area, and, and it can happen for many reasons, you know, and, and of course, you know, being war-torn and all the rest of it is, you know, a very good reason to want to go. But I mean, take countries like Lithuania, for argument's sake. I, mean, I met the Lithuanian Prime Minister last December and spoke to him. When Lithuania joined the European Union, its population was about 2.5 million. Its population now is 1.8 million. And many of those that have left Lithuania are doctors, are lawyers, are accountants. The smartest the young, first, presumably. The young, professional, the bright people needed yeah. Yeah. to help properly build Lithuania have left the country. And Eve, I fear uh, that probably with Syria and other countries like that, uh, that in fact they will lose the very people they will need most to rebuild the country once it gets back to peace. So, so yes, I do completely get that point. You mentioned uh, the leader of Lithuania. Nigel Farage, can I bring in on the, the right-wing leader in Hungary, Viktor Orban, yeah. who said yesterday that the, the new arrivals, he brought faith into it and he's, he's suggesting, no, he's not suggesting, he's saying that this high number of Muslims arriving are quote, threatening Christian heritage of Europe. Yeah, he's not alone in saying that. Is I he mean, right no, he's not alone in saying that. The, no. the, the Slovakian prime minister is, is even stronger in that. A lot of these um, Eastern European countries, Central East, Eastern European countries, uh, with very strong Roman Catholic churches and traditions are very concerned about the number of Muslim people. That's not my concern. My concern is far more serious than that. My concern is that ISIS have actually said that they will use the migrant wave to flood Europe with half a million of their jihadist fighters. Now, even if that's wrong, even if it's only 5,000, in fact, even if it's only 500, I am very worried about that. And already we've seen photographs in Italy of a terrorist suspect for an outrage in Tunisia photographed in Italy who'd come over on one of the boats. We have no means of checking the backgrounds. Of so you're not worried, you don't see this as a faith thing? You're, you're not I, see, I see it. No, I, I think there's, there's a more serious issue. You know, I think our compassion or the EU's interpretation of compassion actually could be a very real threat to our security. And I'm, I'm more worried about that aspect of it, frankly, than anything else. And just lastly on this, how alive do you think British security services and forces are to this? Are they are they lobbying the Prime Minister? Are they working the corridors? Of oh, they're very worried indeed. And, 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 and uh, but of course, they, you know, they never say this sort of thing in public. We know they're worried. Um, and indeed, it was interesting to see John Bolton, the former US ambassador, uh, talking on an American network this week, uh, you know, saying, you know, what on earth are Europe doing? 
they are facing a very, very real problem. And, and again, we're back to this point, you know, genuine refugees, yes, we can accept certain numbers of them, but to encourage people en masse to take risks with their lives, to be in the hands of a traffickers, this is the wrong approach. Okay, we now go to Patrick in Lewisham. Good morning. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I am Polish, and uh, my question is, if Great Britain withdraws from the European Union, what will happen to all the Polish people, all the other Eastern Europeans living here? Nothing. What will you do with them? Just tell Nothing. Them Le- let, let's let's hear from. Stay on the line. I'll bring you back in, Mr. Farage. What will happen to Patrick and and many like him? Nothing. They absolutely, stay. absolutely nothing. Right. Be, Patrick, be, you stay. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, pa- Patrick, when you came here, you came legally. I do not yeah. believe in retrospective law of any kind at all. Uh, and and this this sort of horrendous mythology that was put out about UKIP during the general election, uh, that people here would be would be sort of in some dire danger, is absolute rubbish. You came here legally, you're here legally. That's the end, that's the end of the matter, all right? Before, thanks, Patrick. Before we go on to other calls, while we're talking about the problems uh, with the uh, asylum seekers, migrants, whatever you wish to call them, uh, unfortunately, a couple of representatives of your party have been dragged into this. A North Airship UKIP parliamentary candidate has uh, tweeted a photograph of a boatload of naked women with the caption, if Carlsberg did illegal immigrants, and there are these uh, naked women waving in the sunshine. And a former UKIP candidate, Peter Bucklish, has put the tweet regarding this little boy of whom you and I have been speaking, Mr. Raj. The little Syrian boy was well-clothed and well-fed. He died because his parents were greedy for the good life in Europe. Cue jumping costs. Is this the face right. of UKIP? Well, let's deal with the first one, shall yeah, we? Sure. That was put out by a Tory councillor. The Tory councillor put that picture out on Facebook and it was shared and, and, passed, retweeted, by and retweeted by other party. people. So I don't really think that's relevant at all. Um, the uh, comments by uh, Mr. Butlish, yeah, deeply insensitive, uh, appalling timing. Uh, yes, he did stand for UKIP in the election, but he also stood for the Liberal Democrats as a parliamentary candidate in 2010. So you better ask um, Tim Farron when you see him the same question. Look, you get people in all parties, and he's a classic case of it. Who will say silly things or deeply insensitive things? things and uh, it was deeply insensitive and it did not in any way uh, catch the mood of the nation right we're moving now to ben in harringay yes uh, hello, Nigel. Good um, morning. given the result of the election where you got four million votes and one seat yeah. are you now going to campaign for a proper full proportional representation Oh, Ben, I've thought that electoral reform was necessary for many, many years. Um, I think a lot of young people uh, living in safe Labour or Tory seats just don't bother to vote uh, because they can't see the point. Um, And as you say, this election produced the most extraordinary result we've ever seen. However, um, before I do that and campaign on that question, I've got a more pressing priority, um, and that is the referendum on our EU membership, uh, which I think is the most important constitutional question that we're going to face in our lifetime. Do we want to govern our own country or are we happy to be part of, you know, an expanding European political project? And and, and, and I try to put that as impartially um, as I possibly could. Uh, and, and so, you know, to me, the fundamental question um, isn't, uh, you know, how we order our affairs in Britain. It's whether we're a self-governing nation or not. And at the moment, Ben, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, 75 percent of our laws are not made in this country. They're made somewhere else. Uh, that's what I want to reverse. That's my priority. Once that is done, then yes, I think we do need a different electoral system. Uh, and I also think we need to look at the House of Lords. Uh, which, ah, yes. Tell which me about I, I, I just think. I mean, I, it's, I think Cameron has discredited the House of Lords more than Tony Blair did, which is quite an achievement. Um, and I think just stuffing it full of placemen. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry to say, uh, but it's now past its usefulness. And I think we will, once we've changed the voting system for the Commons, I think we'll need to have a proper look at a second chamber. We do need a second chamber of some sort. Well, I think actually to have a, a change and balance, if you like, to have an upper house, uh, and even if you elected people to the Lords, perhaps you'd elect them for 12 or 15 year terms, um, to have somewhere uh, where legislation can be looked at at a more leisurely pace without quite the same intensity of the party whipping system and everything else, just to make sure things are right. 
and that and the laws that are being made are sort of tickety boo. I think that makes sense. Yeah. It was it was on the show earlier this week that uh, London Mayor Boris Johnson talked. I know he's joking, but talking about a sort of form of voluntary euthanasia to try and get the numbers down. Yeah, well, I think that's almost started actually. It's interesting. We've actually seen quite a few peers retire over the course of the last few months. Just say, look, you know, actually, you know, I'm getting on a bit. I only turn up occasionally. The lunch is pretty good, but really, I'm not sure I could justify still being here. So there is. We're beginning to see a few retire on a voluntary basis. But it is now the largest parliamentary assembly in the world, apart from uh, China's parliament. Uh, it, gives you, it just gives you an idea of how many people have been promoted to the House of Lords. On to other matters. The uh, newspapers are full of advertisements for a tour that's commencing yes. later this month. And you're going to be talking about that later today, Nigel Farage. What is this? Well, uh, really following on very much uh, from my answer uh, to, 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 to Ben in Haringey a moment ago. Um, uh, too much politics uh, over the last couple of decades has taken place inside the confines of the Westminster village uh, with politician and commentator uh, talking to each other and sort of a never-ending round of, you know, lunches and drinks. I mean, not that I'm against that, obviously, but, um, but, but you know, and, it, and it's become the politics of the soundbite. Um, not the politics of going out and actually meeting people. And I've done everything I can to try and reverse that. I think Jeremy Corbyn interestingly, is beginning to do a very similar kind of thing, you know, in, in, in the most remarkable way. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, right, I want there to be, I, I want to, uh, in this referendum, I want us to vote to leave the EU. I'm not going to do that, having lunch in Westminster, but I might help to make that happen travelling around the country. So from next Monday, I'm on the road, I'm on tour, uh, and I shall be on tour until... You know, that referendum happens, and we as a party are launching today... Well, that could be like an 18-month tour. Great! I love it. I mean, uh, it's fun. I like meeting real people. Um, we are launching today the biggest outreach campaign this party's ever launched, and in fact the biggest Eurosceptic campaign since the referendum in 1975. We have 300 public meetings planned, Goodness and anyone can me. come. Uh, if they look at the adverts in the newspapers today, they go to uh, notoeu.com. You just tap in your postcode, and it tells you which meeting is nearest to you. And absolutely everybody is welcome. We want to have a proper public debate. Uh, and the spectators are reporting that in that debate, you're going to make immigration one of the key issues. I think there are three main areas uh, that this referendum will be fought on. I think the first is this basic point about self-government and democracy. You know, are we good enough to make our own laws and negotiate our own trade uh, deals, or do we need this to be done at Brussels level? That's the first point. A subset of that is can we control our borders or not? Uh, and, and, and that, I think, uh, will be the dominating uh, issue of the campaign. And the third area is money. Huge numbers of people out there are furious that we're giving £55 million a day to this organisation whose accounts have not been signed off for a couple of decades. Interestingly, you've not mentioned jobs, and I recall from that debate well, last year, Nigel, uh, sorry, Nick Clegg, as you clashed with you, Nigel Farage, mm, went on and on mm, and on about the number mm, of jobs at risk. It's very interesting. You know, for, for about 20 years now, the pro-EU side have said we'd lose 3 million jobs if we weren't in. And now, when people hear it, they just yawn because they know it's nonsense. People buy and sell goods from each other, regardless whether, On the they're, internet. I mean, but whether they're in political... Yeah, yeah. I, mean, you know, I mean, China sells nearly £300 billion pounds worth of goods into Europe every year. She's not a member of the European Union. So I think that argument um, has lost resonance. And then just lastly, before we go to our next call, which I must give you uh, yep. details on that, uh, Servation, a poll today, 58% <laughs> of people think UKIP risk bringing prejudice into debates on immigration. How do you... Unless you agree, I, I doubt you do. How are you going to counter that? Well, that's a very clever piece of polling. Um, there are, I mean, you have to understand there are uh, certain people in Westminster who are not happy that I'm launching this nationwide tour today. Um, some of the rather posher set than me. Who, Who's the posher set? Oh, there are, you know, some sort of soft conservative Eurosceptics who think they should be in charge of the campaign and they can manage it all from... Can we have any names? And they can manage it all from a few streets in Westminster. Um, I sense so, I'm not going to get So they've been trying since April, uh, so, sorry, since May, since the election result, they've been trying to say, oh, well, Nigel's divisive and Nigel's this and Nigel's that. Um, and this piece of polling has nothing... My name isn't even mentioned in the opinion poll. It was taken during the general election at a moment moment when UKIP was, be was being demonised and it's being dragged out today to coincide but, with our but, launch. But Nigel now, Farage. We have, we have been subject to the most extraordinary hate campaign 
by some elements of the media. Uh, but I think we've won through. And you've only got to look at the figures. You know, seven out of ten, but nearly eight out of ten, British people think we should have proper border controls. But, Mr Farage, in reality, when it comes to politicians, aren't you a bit like Donald Trump, the ultimate Marmite man? No, I don't think that's right. Either people love you, or I have to say the other emotion as well. Well, well at least I've got an much opinion. As, much as even Swindon loves you, <laughs> I've probably got people on the line who despise yeah, you. I'm going to have a coffee next week. <laughs> Look, I've got an opinion. And some people will agree with it, and some people will disagree with it. At least they know what I stand for which over the last couple of decades in British politics has been a more difficult question to answer about. And is that what lies behind Corbyn mania? Yes, I think it is. I think, you know, here's a bloke who stands up and says what he believes. I don't believe in very much of it. Uh, However, I noticed last night on that final debate held on Sky that when the EU question came up, he was very critical of the way the EU would bully Well, you write in the Telegraph today, don't you, about this. You you say that that, that a real Labour leader would actually be a bedfellow, perhaps, for you, Kip. Do you know, in the 1970s... It Tony was Benn. In, it, exactly. But it was the Labour Party in the main uh, that led the No campaign back in 1975, along with many of the trade unions. Uh, I think the left in British politics is waking up to what the EU is. They've seen Greece trampled upon. Uh, they see a transatlantic trade treaty, which they're worried could threaten the viability of the National Health Service. Uh, and what I'm going to say at my meeting today is far from being divisive, I actually want to bring together all the different Eurosceptic elements in this country. Let's forget about right and left wing. That's irrelevant. What we're talking about here is do we get back control of our country? And whether you're a free market conservative or a socialist, if that's something you believe in, let's all get together. I hope Corbyn wins. Why? I, because I think under him there'll be a proper debate on the left of British politics in this referendum about what the EU is. Uh, we move to another caller. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we go to Iduru in Kensington. Hi, uh, Nigel. Hello. Uh, my question is, um, given your stand against the Iran nuclear deal, what's your alternative as a uh, non-interventionist, non-interventionist uh, politician? Uh, well, I haven't. I haven't. Um, I haven't particularly spoken out vehemently about Iran, um, and I do believe that George Orr is a lot better than War War, uh, and I do think the policy uh, that we pursued of sanctions um, against Iran for all that period of time actually was highly ineffective. Um, I, I, look, you know, we of course have to be somewhat cautious of Iran's nuclear motives. Uh, But overall, the fact we are getting on better with Iran than we've done at any point since 1979, I take in a very positive light. All right. All right, there's uh, emails coming in now. Kevin in Mottingham. When are we going to know who the UKIP London mayoralty candidate is? We're going to know the Labour yeah. person with the election of Jeremy Corbyn. It's already decided, Kevin mm-hmm. has. Uh, we already know the Lib Dems, the Conservatives. It's going to be Zach Goldsmith. I don't know how you know this. Uh, who will it be for UKIP? Uh, Kevin, we had, not that I was there, but we had last Sunday and last Monday two whole days of continuous assessments. 52 people applied and paid their fee wow. uh, to apply to be the UKIP London mayor. Uh, we went through, as I say, two whole days um, of interviewing checking, vetting. Uh, There is now to be a shortlist drawn up, I think of five or six, and they will come back in a couple of weeks' time and be be put through an even more intensive process, and we will announce who the UKIP mayoral candidate is going to be on the 25th of September in Doncaster at our national conference. And is Suzanne Evans one of the, on the shortlist? Suzanne Evans was one of the 52. Beyond that, I, I'm, I, I can't tell you. I wasn't there. I have nothing to do with candidate selection. I leave that to others. OK. All right. We look with great interest. I think we've got time. Yes, time for we one have. more. We've got we time for Tom in Chelsea. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Nigel. Good morning, Nick. Hello. Um, my question or request for an opinion for Nigel is on two quick points. Um, should we be um, politically persuading America to take its large fair share of... Um, war refugees from Libya, uh, from Afghanistan, and and importantly, Syria. The second part of my question is um, how strange, um, what's his opinion on the strange quietness of Saudi Arabia, the regional superpower uh, in all of this? A very wealthy and big country, uh, surely they could be doing a bit too, particularly Mm. when, you know, we have such a, a close 
um, you know, uh, you know, uh, touchy feely relationship with them, and they have the second largest embassy in London. Let's hear from Mr. Yeah. Farage. Well, I think uh, you know. I mean, I get the USA question because uh, they were the main drivers, of course, behind the um, Iraq War, and and uh, and they cheered on Sarkozy and Cameron um, over over the ousting of Gaddafi. Um, uh, I wonder, it, it, suddenly border controls have flared up in America uh, as, as part of a huge national debate. Um, Donald Trump uh, may have offended many, but he certainly got a conversation going about what's happening with the Mexican border. You don't um, agree with it, do you, trying to build a wall the length of the border? Uh, hell of a construction project, <laughs> whoever's awarded it. Uh, Do you no, agree with no, it? No, it looks pretty impractical. But look, look, I'm not a Donald Trump supporter, so you try, you tried hard, Nick, but I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, Don't um, blame me for trying, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Farage. Would the United States... Uh, well, if the United Nations... If the United Nations, you know, in this uh, Middle Eastern humanitarian crisis, was to play a decisive role, uh, and was to say we are, it's unlikely, but if they were to, uh, and they were to say, you know, we are going to define who genuine refugees are, uh, and by the way, somebody directly in fear of persecution. That is what a refugee is. So normally it's because of, you know, reasons of race or religion or political opinion or whatever it is. Sexuality. Yeah, yeah, like yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if the UN was to play a decisive role, then I think pressure could be put on the United States of America to take some refugees. But without the UN playing a role, I don't think there's any chance of that happening at all. And we're out of time. Just one final word on one politician we haven't mentioned. How did you respond yesterday when you saw Nicola Sturgeon urging David Cameron to take more people? Indeed, she's on the front page of Scottish newspapers today saying Scotland will open their gates to a thousand of uh, these refugees. Yeah, well, she doesn't understand that Britain ha already has an asylum policy and we do, as I say, there were 25,000 applicants last year. Um, and secondly, uh, she said she didn't want the conscience of the death of that young boy you know, and, and, and that photograph on her mind. If you put up a big sign that says everybody's welcome, I'm afraid what you will lead to are more of those deaths and more of those disasters. This policy isn't working. Well, listen, Joy, I, I, the, the, the House of Lords reform, where does Boris Johnson stand on I, this? I think the whole thing has got completely out of control, Joy, and I have to say I'm with you, and I think, well, in the sense, I think, eight, well, 843 members. 866, 866. Now, second highest...